Welcome to Old Treasures Made New, your devotional podcast on the go or at home, where we read the scriptures and reflect on them with those from the past. Today we're reading Mark 14, verses 43 to 52, and through J.C. Ryle's expository thoughts on Mark. Please take a moment to pause and to ask the Holy Spirit to bring understanding and to apply what we hear. Mark, chapter 14, verses 43 to 52. And immediately, while he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the scribes of the elders. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I kiss will be the man. Seize him and lead him away under guard. And when he came, he went up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and he kissed him. And they laid hands on him and seized him. But one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out as against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me, but let the scriptures be fulfilled. And they all left him and fled. And a young man followed him with nothing but a linen cloth about his body. And they seized him, but he left the linen cloth and ran away naked. This is the word of the Lord. Let us notice in these verses how little our Lord's enemies understood the nature of his kingdom. We read that Judas came to take him with a great multitude of swords and clubs. It was evidently expected that our Lord would be vigorously defended by his disciples and that he would not be taken prisoner without fighting. The chief priests and scribes clung obstinately to the idea that our Lord's kingdom was a worldly kingdom and therefore supposed that it would be upheld by worldly means. They had yet to learn the solemn lesson contained in our Lord's words to Pilate, My kingdom is not of this world. John 18.36 We shall do well to remember this in all our endeavors to extend the true kingdom of religion. It is not to be propagated by violence or by an arm of the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. 2 Corinthians 10.4 and Zechariah 4.6 The cause of truth does not need force to maintain it. False religions, such as Mohammedanism, have often been spread by the sword. False Christianity, like that of the Roman Church, has often been forced on men by bloody persecutions. But the real gospel of Christ requires no such aids as these. It stands by the power of the Holy Spirit. It grows by the hidden influence of the Spirit on men's hearts and consciences. There is no clearer sign of a bad cause in religion than a readiness to appeal to the sword. Let us notice, secondly, in these verses, how all things in our Lord's passion happened according to God's word. His own address to those who took him exhibits this in a striking matter. The scripture must be fulfilled. There was no accident or chance in any part of the close of our Lord's earthly ministry. The steps in which he walked from Gethsemane to Calvary were all marked out hundreds of years before. The 22nd Psalm and the 53rd chapter of Isaiah were literally fulfilled. The wrath of his enemies, his rejection by his own people, his being dealt with as a malefactor, his being condemned by the assembly of the wicked, all had been foreknown and all foretold. All that took place was only the working out of God's great design to provide an atonement for world sins. The armed men whom Judas brought to lay hands on Jesus were, like Nebuchadnezzar and Sennacherib, unconscious instruments in carrying God's purposes into effect. Let us rest our souls on the thought that all around us is ordered and overruled by God's almighty wisdom. The course of this world may often be contrary to our wishes. The position of the church may often be very unlike what we desire. The wickedness of worldly men and the inconsistencies of believers may often afflict our souls. But there is a hand above us, moving the vast machine of this universe and making all things work together for his glory. The scriptures are being yearly fulfilled. Not one jot or tittle in them shall ever fail to be accomplished. 
the kings of the earth may take counsel together, and the rulers of the nations may set themselves against Christ. Psalm 2.2 2. But the resurrection morning shall prove that even at the darkest time, all things were being done according to the will of God. Let us notice thirdly in these verses how much the faith of true believers may give way. We are told that when Judas and his company laid hands on our Lord, and he quietly submitted to be taken prisoner, the eleven disciples all forsook him and fled. Perhaps up to that moment they were buoyed up by the hope that our Lord would work a miracle and set himself free. But when they saw no miracle worked, their courage failed them entirely. Their former protestations were all forgotten. Their promises to die with their master, rather than deny him, were all cast to the winds. The fear of present danger got the better of faith. The sense of immediate peril drove every other feeling out of their minds. They all forsook him and fled. There is something deeply instructive in this incident. It deserves the attentive study of all professing Christians. Happy is he who marks the conduct of our Lord's disciples and gathers from it wisdom. Let us learn from the flight of these eleven disciples not to be overconfident in our own strength. The fear of man does indeed bring a snare. We never know what we may do if we are tempted, or to what extent our faith may give way. Let us be clothed with humility. Let us learn to be charitable in our judgment of other Christians. Let us not expect too much from them, or set them down as having no grace at all if we see them overtaken in a fault. Let us not forget that even our Lord's chosen apostles forsook him in his time of need. Yet, they rose again by repentance and became pillars of the church of Christ. Finally, let us leave the passage with a deep sense of our Lord's ability to sympathize with his believing people. If there is one trial greater than another, it is the trial of being disappointed in those we love. It is a bitter cup which all true Christians have frequently to drink. Ministers fail them. Relations fail them. Friends fail them. One sister and after another proves to be broken and to hold no water. But let them take comfort in the thought that there is one unfailing friend, even Jesus, who can be touched with the feelings of their infirmities and has tasted all their sorrows. Jesus knows what it is to see friends and disciples falling from him in the hour of need. Yet, he bore it patiently and loved them, notwithstanding all. He is never weary of forgiving. Let us strive to do likewise. Jesus, at any rate, will never fail us. It is written, His compassions fail not. Lamentations 3.22 that is the end of Rao's expository thoughts for these verses. Let us carefully consider what we have heard today, and may the Lord be pleased to bring the growth for His glory. In considering what we have just heard, would you prayerfully ask yourself and others the following questions? First, is our confidence in the Spirit of God to take and use His Word to transform hearts, or do we find greater power in other things? Second, does the sovereignty of God in his providential hand in all things give us comfort and peace? Or does it just make us uncomfortable, and is it an area of dispute? Third, are we more often confident in our own abilities or in God's abilities? Are we clothed with humility as we walk day by day in this world? And fourth, when we sin and fall, do we find Jesus as one who can sympathize with us? Or is he more like a moral police officer rifling through our baggage, longing to find something and beat us over the head?